Hello, listeners. Yamina here. Welcome to the Dr. GPCR podcast. As we return to a regular programming after a fantastic four series episodes honoring Dr. Mark Ron, we would like to take a moment and thank our Dr. GPCR ecosystem partners for their support. We'd like to thank Domain Therapeutics, GPCR Therapeutics, Design Pharmaceuticals, Montana Molecular, and Orion Biotechnology. We have a few announcements to make. We want to let you know that we are revamping the Dr. GPCR Summit, which we ran from 2020 to 2022, and are launching the Dr. GPCR Symposia events. This series, with this series, we aim to bring you, our ecosystem site members, regular and topic-specific virtual free live events. The first symposium of the series will be held on Friday, March 24th, starting at 8 a.m. EST. We will host a full day of talks on Zoom and a two-hour poster slash networking session on Wonder. The topic of this recent of this event is recent advances in understanding challenging GPCRs. Our confirmed speakers include Graham Milligan, Ines Liebscher, Ben Myers, Antonella DiPizio, Lucas Graz, Jake Mahoney, Brendel, Brendan Wilkins, and Anthony Picard. All trainees are welcome to come and present a poster. There won't be any poster selection. Everyone is welcome. For more information and an updated schedule, you can visit the ecosystem. The easiest way to get to it is to use the links in the footer and look for Dr. GPCR Symposia. You will be able to join us by making marking your calendar and becoming a Dr. GPCR Ecosystem Free Site member. After the event, and if speakers give us permission to record, you will also be able to watch these videos with your premium membership indefinitely. To navigate the ecosystem and find more information about our new events and everything that we do at Dr. GPCR, please use the direct links in the footer to navigate the website. And now, let's dive into this episode. Hello, everyone. This is Yamina from Dr. GPCR. And the, today, or this evening, I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Bruno Giro. Uh, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name, your last name right. I forgot to ask you how to do so before <laughs> we record. So please excuse. Uh, it's okay. G G Giros is a... It's the correct right way to, to say it. Okay, so Bruno Giros, uh, nice nice to meet you. Nice to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you, Yamina. I'm very excited to talk to you today. Um, we've exchanged a few emails, and uh, why don't we start at the beginning, and if you could introduce yourself and tell us who you are and what do you do. Sure. Uh, then, I'm not a beginner in research, if I can say so. I started my research in 83, uh, doing my master and then my PhD with Jean-Charles Schwartz at INSERM in Paris. And uh, there, my, my background was biochemistry and, and a bit of molecular biology. And I started to work on the degradation of encephalins and characterizing aminopeptidase and encephalinase. And uh, after my, my PhD, I had the opportunity to go to Genentech in South San Francisco for six months to actually learn molecular biology. And that was really the golden years, you know, for cloning. Uh, in Genentech, you had like David Godel, uh, Peter Seberg, uh, all these kind of people. And I, I was working with a former member of the Schwartz lab, Bernard Malfroy, and I participated to the cloning of aminopeptidase M. And when I came back to Schwartz, it was like my first postdoc, if I can say so, in 87. And then we started to work on uh, dopamine receptors. And uh, we had the chance, if I can say so, the luck to rapidly step on and to rapidly be able to clone first the D2 dopamine receptor isoforms, the long and short, and then the D3 dopamine receptor. It was in 89, two, two papers in nature. It was really very successful years at uh, this time. The cloning years. <laughs> That's and, what I was uh, going to say. <laughs> you clone uh, it, you're uh, nature. Good. <laughs> exactly. You know, so a paper that you would not even publish in plus one now. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I think so too. Uh, then exactly. But uh, that's how it worked anyway. 
uh, you have to be on the fashion uh, time. And then, uh, and then after that, I wanted, I obtained a position at CNRS in uh, in eighty seven, uh, but still I wanted to to go for a postdoc. Okay, because I, I thought it was very important for my training, you know, to move out from France. I already spent like six months in South San Francisco. And uh, and then, you know, looking at different papers that were out, it was kind of obvious to me that I had to go to work with Marc Caron. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he just cloned the D1 dopamine receptor. Uh, and then I arrived there in, in 91, in August 91. And because I didn't want to compete at this time with my former lab, I decided to shift from receptors. And anyway, all dopamine receptors were cloned at this time, you know, and to to shift from receptors to transporters. And uh, I started to work on the cloning, if it was possible, of the dopamine transporter. And then I started, it was August 91, and in three months, with my colleagues, Alal Mestikawi, and with the strong support from Mark, I was able to actually clone and characterize the function of the dopamine transporter in three months, you know, like 18 hours of work a day. <laughs> it, was, it was how it was working at this time. And, uh, and then we had almost a complete story. And then we learned from an insider that the group of Susan Amara with Randy Blakely just had a paper accepted in Nature for the cloning of the dopamine transporter. Then we wrote a paper in three days. Wow, okay, <laughs> three months, you know? three wow. <laughs> exactly, that was crazy. Uh, probably the fastest paper I never wrote, you know. <laughs> and we submitted to FEPS later, and it was accepted in, in, in one week and still published in 91. Maybe a few weeks after the Nature paper from Suzanne Amara. But still the same year, you know. I, I, it was really crazy, a, a crazy time. You know? and, uh, <laughs> but wow. uh, I, I, and I should say that I, I stayed for three years with Mark, and it was like my golden years, you know, because everything was smooth. Mark's support was constant. The money was flowing, flowing, you know. I mean, we had no problems to to spend money <laughs> and to do as much experiment as we wanted to do. And I, 91, you know, it was the years where uh, there was these very new techniques that just came that was uh, conditional knockout, mm -hmm. conditional recombinations. And uh, I, I wanted to go there and, and to, to try to make the knockout of the dopamine transporter. Actually, I, I started four knockouts together, dopamine transporter, uh, GRK2. Uh, the mu opiate receptor and the fourth one I even don't remember but the two last did not work okay and uh, Mark well, I, I, I talked with Mark and I, I told him you know I would like to go for the conditional knockout for the constitutive knockout using uh, recombination and he told me you know there is this laboratory uh, at UNC Chapel Hill that was at this time the lab of uh, Oliver Smithies, who actually gets the Nobel Prize a few years later for knockout, actually, with Mario Capecchi. And uh, Mario Capecchi was at Salt Lake City. And, uh, and then Mark told me, OK, I, I can put you in contact with a, a former postdoc of uh, Smithies lab. Her name was Beverly Kohler. And she just started a kind of facility for knockout. You know, then I was doing all the molecular biology, uh, cloning the gene for the dopamine transporter in mice, making the different recombinations that were needed. And he, with Beverly Kohler, she, I sent actually her, I sent her my construct, and she did all the work in ES cells, and then uh, injecting the ES cells into blastocysts to generate mice. Uh, and then she sent me the first 12 mice that were born from this recombination. I run a classical uh, thousand blood, you know, to check for the cuts mm -hmm. and to see if we had the correct uh, knocking out and no, nothing. There was nothing for the 12 first mice. I was a bit disappointed. I showed that to Mark, we discussed, and we, 
continue. And then she sent me 12 more mice. And on the 12 more mice, we had like six founders. You know, that was like, wow. wow. Uh, and I was so excited. I remember at <laughs> this time, Mark was as excited as I was, and he actually offered me flowers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 was, I was on the bench and he sent me flowers. I said, ah, Bruno, I should give you that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was really very, very exciting. Uh, and then the GRK2 knockout also works well, but uh, we mostly work at uh, this time. I mean, the, that knockout came first, and I mostly work on that. And... Uh, generate enough mice to start to do behavior, characterization, and so on and so on. But then I, I, I had to go back to France to, to actually recollect my, my CNRS position in 94. And for one year, I kept working on the mice. Ma Mark actually sent me the mice in Paris. I did all the behavior, locomotor activity, and things like that in Paris. And we published the paper in 96. Wow. And it was, uh, it was really, again, golden years. Huh? Uh, and <laughs> something I remember, I mean, I, I'm sure you already had a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, insight into uh, the way Mark was functioning. You, you know, something, I think there are two important things to say about Mark. The first one, he, has, he was really a very nice person. I mean, I mean, really, fundamentally, you know, he was like a very nice human being. And he was also very well connected, which means that uh, this was a strength. You know, it's not like we were talking every day, but I, I knew that when I needed something, when I needed some insights, he, he, he would be always there for me to to share his ideas and to to actually help me with his connection to to find the good people to work with. And when I was in Paris and I, I ran the first. Uh, locomotor activity and of course that knockout without the dopamine transporter they were like fully under cocaine you know <laughs> because it's not that you had to block the dat it was not there anymore which means that they were really hyper hyper active okay? and this is what came first when we did the locomotor activity and then i remember i sent mark a fax at this time it was fax huh? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> email were not working as it is now uh, then I sent him a fact, you know, with the first uh, figure showing the increase of locomotor activity. Fifteen years later, then probably in 2000 something, he came in Paris with uh, Pauline for a meeting. And then uh, I, I met him in a cafe, you know, we, we drank a beer and we discussed and how are you and what are you doing and so on. He was always... Anytime I met him, you know, he was always so excited about the work that was done in his lab. It was amazing. Huh? Like 18 years old uh, <laughs> student. Yeah. You know? and, uh, and then we discussed. And then he took his wallet out of his pocket. And from his wallet, he took a, 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 a sheet of paper that was uh, folded in, in two eight. And he showed it to me, and that was the fax I sent him 15 years before, you know. And I said, wow. <laughs> and I, I said that story, you know, when we had this uh, meeting with Bob right after Mark's uh, passing. <laughs> and uh, what I say is that, you know, it shows me how romantic <laughs> somehow yes. Mark was, you know, and how he was really connected to research and to science. That was like his whole life. Together with his life, of course, with Pauline. Huh? And uh, I remember how fusionnel they were together. And of course, when I was at Duke, every summer, we had this uh, lobster party at his place. Uh, Which I, I heard about, have... yeah. Yes, I still have some pictures. And my wife remembers that very well because my, my wife is fond about lobster and she remembers she was eating like six, five, six lobsters all <laughs> together, you know. And Mark was really <laughs> stunned by that. You know, because, exactly, because my, my wife is not very tall, you know, and she's very thin, <laughs> but she had a capacity for lobster eating that was amazing. <laughs> And uh, that, that was at his, at, at his first place. And, I, and then when I was there, I think it was probably in 90, 94 or something like that, he bought his new house that was more like a barn, you know, a farm. Uh, 
-hmm. where he, he was able to have animals, even a bull, if I remember correctly. Wow. That's okay. That, that <laughs> I did not hear about in, in our podcast series. Before. Yes, yes, yes. But interestingly, someone had mentioned the facts, uh, with a folded fax sheet in his wallet. And uh, that's exactly so people who, who listened to the previous episodes now can be yeah, yeah, yeah. but actually a face to the name and connect it with, with that. Uh, uh, exactly. That was, that was the locomotive activity of the <laughs> that knockout mice. I know. Then uh, it, it was really. Uh... <laughs> It, it was really very nice to see that. Huh? And, uh, and also, I remember, you know, when I was there, you know, his three children were still young. Huh? Yeah. And, uh, and they were there also. And then now they grow up. And also, something I remember, like 15 years later, when I was seeing Mark, he was very proud about uh, Kathleen because she was also doing, I mean, also very proud with Nelson. Uh, uh, and also his, his other daughter, I just don't remember her name. Melissa. But uh, Melissa, yeah. And uh, but he was very proud about the fact that that Kathleen, you know, was doing science, and he was even telling me, oh, you know, she's doing things much better than I am doing, you know, <laughs> much more important than what I am doing, you know. He was really very, very that's, proud of that. That's amazing, Bruno. Before we continue. Uh about your time in Mark's lab and, and afterwards. Let, let's go back to the beginning because I'm very curious about, about your interest in science as a young person. I want to say maybe as a child even. Did you always know that you wanted to be a scientist or what does that come from? I, actually, not really, you know. The thing is that I, I, I don't want to to brag about it, but I, I, I was, I just realized that much later, I was kind of uh, over gifted, you say that, huh? with, yeah. Uh, yeah. with a very, very high IQ, but yeah. but then not very, not very good at school, you know, even if I had my baccalaureate, I was 16. Mm -hmm. and, and then I went to do med school for, for two years. But I missed it, you know, because at this time I was riding horse four times a week, four days a week. You know, I was, I was really not working because for me, university, it was like freedom, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I was doing anything but studying. And then after two years of failure, my father told me, Bruno, now you have to succeed your studies. If not, you will go for your military training and I will not take care of you anymore. Then I said, okay. So cut you off. <laughs> exactly. Then I, I went for, to the university to do a, a master in science and biology, and I was very successful. And then I liked it very much, you know, but it was not research yet. Huh? It was really theoretical training. Huh? And, uh, and then at this time, I wanted, when I finished my master and want to start a PhD, I wanted to work on peptides. Because somehow it was new in 86, uh, 82, 83. And I wanted to, to work with peptides. And I went to see uh, uh, Philippe Acher, who was one of my professors. And I asked him, where can I go? And he said, OK, you can go to Jacques Glovinsky, or you can go to Bernard Rock, or to Jean-Pierre Changeux, uh, and Joshua Schwartz. Okay, then I went to see all these guys. <laughs> I remember this story very... I, I went in Jacques Glowensky lab, and then I, I talked with Marie Jo Besson. She was one of the head scientists in his lab, and she was working with dopamine, and she said, oh, we are doing that. At this time, it was push-pull cannula. It was not microdialysis, you know, it was okay. kind of microdialysis, but it was called push-pull cannula. And she asked me if I wanted to work on dopamine. I said, oh... <laughs> I thought, no. oh, oh, dopamine, but we know everything about dopamine. I don't want to work with dopamine. <laughs> you know, like you? I, was, I, I was young and stupid. Huh? <laughs> Did you ever think that after this, you'd be cloning the dopamine? Uh, no, I, I, absolutely not. And then I decided to work with Schwartz and I work on the degradation of encephalines. You know, that was peptide. Yeah. And then, as I told you, then I moved to Genentech, learned molecular biology, went back to Schwartz and worked with dopamine. And, and then all that to tell you that, no, I, I did not add like, uh, uh, I, I was not I was not feeling that I wanted to, to do research and I was six years old, you know, it was to me, it was it was really something that, that takes me, you know, when I started to work at the bench. 
I say, okay, that's it. That is what I like, you know. And uh, it was, uh, you know, using my curiosity and uh, and and then I, I really dive into it very deeply, you know. Yeah, and like and liked it very much, yeah. That's what happens, I think, when with with high IQ people typically, it's very difficult to do the the academic part in school. But then when they find what they really like and they excel at. I think uh, Sudar Rajagopal also had his undergrad at 16. Uh, not, uh, I think, yeah, undergrad, not undergrad, sorry, a high school done sooner mm -hmm. or something like that. But he was, I think, two or three years ahead of ahead of the, his his time based on his age. And that's very unique as well. Yeah. And then I was I was somehow lucky, you know, to find that, you know, because uh, it, it's really, I mean, into that since uh, almost 40 years. So, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and and I still liked it very much, you know. But I should say that I, after I went back from Marx yeah. in in 1994, uh, then I wanted to have my own laboratory, you know. In France, it's not like you are a PI, you know. You start small. You you have to have an inserm or CNRS lab. Then in '99, I was like one of the youngest uh, director of an inserm laboratory. And I wanted to work on psychiatry disorders, you know. Mm -hmm. Then I team up with a with a psychiatrist named, which is Marion Le Boyer. She's a very famous geneticist. And then for ten years, I put people together. Like for example, we were the first to identify a gene for autism with Thomas Bourgeron and, and Marion Le Boyer. That I, I put them together. Uh, but I was not like, of course, the main. Uh, scientist on that you know it was done in my lab and we did a lot of things in my lab most but I, I was mostly doing administrative stuff you know and I just get bored and then the CNRS proposed me to take the head of a large institute but I did not really want to do that and this is when I had the opportunity to move to Canada to Montreal at McGill University Rémi Quirion he was at this time the head of the Douglas Institute And he told me, okay, we have a chair opening, you know, are you interested? And I said, okay, to me, either I go full administrative or I keep doing research, which was what, what I liked. And I, I moved back to McGee. Something else I should say also is that you know, it takes me a long time to realize that. But, you know, when we were doing cloning, you have two kinds of research, you know, that you have hypothesis driven and you have technically driven research. Okay, cloning, cloning was more like technically driven research. Okay, you have to work a lot, of course, to be smart enough because it was very competitive. And uh, but, but somehow you don't put much thought into the hypothesis you want to work on. Okay, and me, it took me probably 10 years to shift from technically driven to hypothesis driven research, which I am doing now, you know, which is, of course, the model of the dat knockout mice were really very helpful for me to go into that, okay, mm -hmm. because then we had to do a lot of behavior and then questions came, you know, and then we start, I started to, to work on that little by little. And when I arrived in Montreal, I was ready for that, I would say, you know, to develop my own line of research. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, at this time but uh, but still working for example one of the last work we have done on dopamine it's trying to answer to odd questions because of course you know better than me that since 10 years new technical possibilities are so amazing you know with this optogenetic stuff you know all, all these kind of things and um, and then the old question I wanted to ask was What is the role of neurons in the striatum that co-express D1 and D2 dopamine receptors? And that was back from, from the cloning years, you know, in the 89, 90s. There were two groups at this time. Uh, uh, there was a, the group of uh, Alan Levy, the group of uh, Jim Surmeyer, uh, the group of, um, uh, in, in Bordeaux, I, uh, oh shit, I don't remember the name, it will come up. But at this time, there was this question about, of course, the 
first in situ hybridization for D1 and D2 receptor in the striatum, you know, seeing these two population, the so-called direct uh, population that go out from the striatum expressing D1 dopamine receptor, the indirect a pathway expressing the D2 dopamine receptor. And there were some neurons, some GABAergic neurons in the striatum, these medium spiny neurons, that were co-expressing D1 and D2. And nobody really knew what they were there for. It was like 5% of the total number of neurons. And then came the technique of intersectional genetics a few years ago. You know, you know using the CRELOX, and the FLIPES FRT technique. Then here in Montreal, I, I engineer a D1 FLIPES mouse, and it allows me for the first time to actually uh, be able to target this D1, D2 co-expressing neuron with a D1 FLIPES and A2A P mice, because A2A, you know, is in all, A2A adenosine 2 a receptor is in all D2 neurons in the striatum. And then, we use viruses that have been designed by Desrot, Carl Desrot, called the intersect virus, that would allow us to express the channel rhodopsin only in the D1, D2 neurons. And we were able to, to trace them for the first time to see where they are do, going and, and to make all the functional studies. Awesome. And this was done in collaboration with my colleague uh, Alban de Kerkov and Patricia Bonavion in Bruxelles University. And then uh, we have a paper submitted now. Uh, but you see, it's a, all, it's a question that, that was asked in the 90s. And then we can answer to it now, you know, with this, all these new amazing tools. Yeah, you and, don't have uh, to fax the results anymore. <laughs> you could just exa exactly, them. exactly. We can email, we can Zoom, we can discuss, yes. you know, it, it's amazing. Exactly. I'm curious mm -hmm. to hear more about that. Uh, three months of work in, in Mark's lab and a three-day paper writing. Um, how was how was it to write a paper in three days with Mark? Okay, first, the three months of work. You know, at this time, we we use uh, cloning. For cloning, we use what was called degenerated PCR. Mm -hmm. Okay, because there were two transporters that were cloned, the GABA transporter, and the noradrenaline transporter. Okay, then there were some homology sequences between them, uh, and then we use that. We we, we designed uh, degenerated primers for doing PCR. We took we prepare some messenger RNA from the striatum. At this time, <laughs> we prepare messenger RNA using a cesium chloride gradient. Wow. <laughs> you know? it, it was not just simple colons. You know, we had to. To, to, to kill a lot of mice, to take the striatum, to extract the messenger RNA. Then we put it in an ultra centrifuge with cesium chloride. And then we had a very thin band of RNA that we took, you know. And then we, we did the generated PCR from that. It works very well, actually, you know. Uh, I had already a long experience of cloning. Then as soon as we had the first, um, the first uh, uh, degenerated fragment, we clone them into plasmid. Then we screen the phage libraries. E everything is done in silico now, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what I was thinking. I was like, oh my God, this is so uh, labor intensive. Uh, exactly. At this time, you know, it, it was like that. Huh? We did the sequencing with uh, P32, then P35, you know, that is less uh, problematic. Uh, we we run these very long sequencing gels for hours, you know, and things like that. And I've done that, that was, once. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> that, that was that was really, uh, yeah, very again golden years and so so exciting. I was working with my colleague Salah Mistikawi and with a, a, a technician that was in Mark's lab, and, and Mark, you know, he he put like all all his uh, possible support with me. Then it went very fast. And then for writing of the paper, I mean, then we had all the data. <coughs> I was doing the figures and Mark was writing the text, you know, and uh, we read it, we proofread it and so something like that. Then he contacted one of his colleagues that was one of the editor of Feb's letter, he talked to him. 
And he said, okay, we can send him the paper. It will be reviewed very rapidly. And again, you know, I think this could not have been possible without Mark's connections, huh, of course. Uh, and then in almost one, two weeks, it was accepted. But again, the writing was, was also very smooth. Huh? I, I write most of the material and methods and technical parts, you know, and figures and Mark wrote the introduction, discussion, you know. But, but again, these learning papers, they were kind of easy to write somehow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it, it was as as you mentioned. It was a very technical period, and it wasn't a hypothesis driven. So you basically had to. I've been reviewing old papers for other purposes. Well, review, reading old papers for other purposes, and they were all about cloning something. And then it's exactly. pretty straightforward. And I was just trying to think. You mentioned this was published in ninety one. I was trying to figure out whether this was written on a computer or was it some FedExed in or. Or it was like? at this time it was written on computer, yes. But you know, I remember I get my first email address in, in 90 just before going to the state. And at this time, of course, university were connected, but uh, and when we send a mail, it, it it should not make more than three or four lines because after it will uh, it it will not go forward. You know? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really, and, and, and when I wrote my thesis, you know, it was like, we did not really add the word processing software. Then we were typing and to make bold, we had to do F1, underline it was like F2, wow. you know. <laughs> On a typewriter. <laughs> yeah, wow. yeah, it, it, it was like that. And I remember uh, the, when I was uh, in Mark's lab in 91, 92, it's not like everybody had his own laptop. There was a computer room actually, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, you know like the first Apple uh, <laughs> Apple computers, you know, and uh, then we had to book the computers, you know, and things like that in order to use them. You know, it, it was not as uh, easy going as it is now. Right now, here it is. Then, uh, Here's your computer. <laughs> uh, exactly, you can have everything on your phone or. Uh, then, uh, th then uh, no, it was it was really the beginning of all that. And but there was, you know, also, you know, for the we I remember we had to bought a, a software for uh, uh, reading the sequences, for example, you know. Yeah. And we, we we bought a special keypad with GATC, you know, that makes it wow. easier to <laughs> to to actually. Uh, I uh, read the sequences and yeah. things like that, and but all, all that, yeah, it was the beginning, but it was it was working well. I mean, it was, uh, uh, and again, you know, I, I I remember also when I was with Mark, you know, I was cloning a lot of things. I cloned also some some other genes and things like that that we published, and uh, I, I cloned at some point. I cloned a receptor that. I did not knew what it was. It was probably a GPCR, you know, but, uh, and, and then I had to express it in CHO and to look for what could bind to it. Okay. And I remember it was probably a nightmare for Mark, but he never, he never make me any problem with that. I think at this time, I probably ordered all the NAN catalog for uh, radio label molecules, <laughs> <You know? laughs> more than 60 radio label molecules in order to look for a possible binding, you know. And I had something, it, it was binding to ATP, if I remember correctly, or ADP, you know, a, a nucleotide. And then I was very excited, Mark was very excited and things like that. And then I met control and so on. And then we realized after a few months that it was not the receptor I was expressing that bind. It was a contamination oh. into the CHO cells, you know. <laughs> and and then we had this contamination. It was binding to it. And it was just a drop-dead uh, project. <laughs> Did you ever figure out what it was? No, 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 <laughs> never. <laughs> never. <laughs> it, it remains a <laughs> question mark. That question mark box <laughs> too. Uh, exactly. Maybe, maybe you know. Actually, I'm I'm not even sure. I still have the sequence somewhere that 
maybe if I look in database now, I would, yeah, I, yeah I, I could probably find something, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> That'd be interesting to know. I mean, I'd be interested if you ever get a chance to blast, you find a sequence <laughs> and you blast it. I'm curious to see. What, yeah, what I, 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 I just have to maybe find my odd floppy disk. <laughs> <laughs> and well, well, you're going to laugh, but um, I, I still do have a little um, floppy disk carrier type of thing. You put the floppy in and with a USB, you can flop okay. it into a computer. Okay. Um, and full disclosure, I borrowed it from a colleague during my post postdoc at Rockefeller and I never returned it to her, but I still have okay. it. And I still have some floppy disks. <laughs> okay. Okay. It may be convenient. I just have to, to, to locate the floppy disk. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I'll send it to you or next time I stop in Montreal. I'll, <laughs> yeah, I'll... Yeah. Actually speaking of, of stopping and meeting, I saw the program for the upcoming GPC Great Lakes GPC retreat this year. Yes. And I yes. Saw yes. You'll be speaking and I will also be at the meeting. Um, good, good. As as part of the organizing committee, um, okay. And and I saw I saw your name on the program. I was like, yes, we're gonna get to meet in person. So maybe I'll bring yes, it over. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, okay. I, yeah. I'll let you know if I find the floppy disk. Yeah, I, I will. you have until November second of this yeah, yeah. year. <laughs> but uh, and you know, for instance, my this last paper I was doing on the D one D two, I actually sent it to Mark, and he was kind enough to read it and to make some comments and things like that. And then actually, I, he's in the acknowledgement. And I was so excited to to be able to see him at the last dopamine meeting in Montreal in May, you know, then mm -hmm. his passing really came as a, as a, a shock. tornado. Uh, oh, really a shock. Huh? It was uh, yeah. uh, because uh, and I, I, can, I was kind of following what he was doing. And, you know, Mark, actually, I, I think his real background in his real gift was pharmacology. He was, he was really a pharmacologist. Okay. And, uh, and when he, I know that after all the cloning and knockout period, you know, after me, there was Raoul yeah. and there was Martha Beaulieu and there was Steve Ferguson, you know, yeah. all these people, you know, and, uh, and I know he shifted to something that was a biased, uh, ligand, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, biased agonist for the, the D1. I think he was mostly working on the D1, a little bit on the D2 also. But that was really what he wanted to do. And each time I was seeing him, I mean, you know, like maybe every two years in meetings and things like that, he was al always very excited. You know, he showed me the data he had and uh, what he was doing. And he, I think he was really uh, working with Brian Ross also and with, mm -hmm. with many people like that. And of course, we, with Mark Whiteman, you know, that I knew when he was in his lab also when we did the that knockout. And um, he was really excited. I, I think it was, again, he, he was, in a way, he was very visionary be, because that's really where people go now, you know, and this is really the future of, uh, of uh, drug development. Huh? When you see also the work that Michel Bouvier is doing in his lab, these kind of things, you know, and uh, th that's really the future for drug development, you know, to be able to, and again, it, it was like essential into that, huh? to to yeah. to investigate cell signalization after receptor activation, you know, the way it could go, it could go through barestine or uh, through other kind of uh, of intracellular uh, coupling. And to be able to dissociate, you know, cyclic AMP production or uh, yeah. inositol phosphate or all these kind of things. And that, that was really lucky. Like, and I should say the D1, uh, <laughs> he worked on the D1. And the, the D1 for some years did not really interest people. People were mostly focusing on the D2, you know, antipsychotics. Yeah. The D3 also, a potential target for antipsychotics. But then the D1 is coming back, I, I think, now a lot, you know, for cognitive deficits in schizophrenia or other psychiatric disorders. And uh, that's really too bad, you know, that he could not continue that because uh, I'm sure he would have done, again, great discovery, you know. And uh, I should say that in, in between us, you know, the former Marx postdoc, we we have been always a little bit uh, 
disappointed for him that he didn't get the Nobel Prize with uh, with Bob Lefkowitz. And this is something we talked a lot in between us, you know. But mm-hmm. I guess that's it. And and when I talk about that to Mark, again, he was such a, a nice person that he had no, or at least he didn't told us, you know, but he had like no no belief for that, you know. I think... Uh, it- a couple of things transpired in the podcast episodes when we had the the different groups and one thing came through is that mark was very humble yes and yes. and also the fact that he his research was so diverse he had what you'd think of now as a pipeline and that was 20 years ago where everybody was working on similar questions but using different approaches and i think steve ferguson made a comment and and martin Beaulieu as well saying well the problem was you could nominate you could not nominate mark for something because he was so wide in his research that it was very difficult to get you know him approved through these committees that would award prizes for something very narrow um but but i think everybody everybody's comments through the throughout the the three episodes that we recorded with the different panels was that yes from a contribution to the dopamine to the gpcr field to science his his place between the Nobel laureates is well well deserved there. No, sure, huh? And you know, when you mentioned that, I remember I didn't talk a lot with Bob Lefkowitz because I was really a Marx uh, postdoc, but I, I had some opportunities to discuss with him. And I remember one thing he, he told me at some. He said, "You know, Bruno, there are three things that are important in research. The first one is focus." The second one is focus, and the third one is focus. And he, he would be saying, "Oh, and I forgot there is a fourth one. It's focus." And <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 that probably the difference, you know, besides the size of the ego, <laughs> I would say yeah. Yeah. that's yeah. probably the difference, you know. But as you say, Mark was very humble, you know, and he was very happy about doing what he was doing. Uh, and it, it's amazing when, you know, when we had this dopamine meeting in May. Uh, because of the of the very recent passing of Mark, uh, we decided to to make a special opening of the meeting, mm-hmm. and uh, then uh, there was Dave Solzer and uh, and uh, Louis Eric uh, Trudeau mm-hmm. were in charge of the meeting. I asked them, they, they told me, of, "Of course, you can do that." Then I prepared, you know, three or four slides, and I. We ask, I ask all the former Marx postdocs that were in the room to, to come on, on the floor. And there were like 12 people. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, and of course, not all of them were there. I mean, Martin was not there, you know, and people like that. And, and, uh, but just to see the impact he had in terms of training. And that was, that was really huge, you know. That's great. Well, we it's you know you mentioned remembering Mark at the dopamine meeting. I think the GPCR retreat last year yes. was before or after the I think before right before the dopamine meeting, and we we did. When I say we were actually it was Michel, Steve, and and Martin Beaulieu who were not only the organizers but also the the close friends and collaborators of Mark, and that was it was a very, I want to say a very emotional. A uh, couple of of slides that Michelle had shown and and uh, and Steve as well. So I think it was a very nice tribute to Mark. No, no, you know the thing is that I mean we will remember him for so many years. You know, <laughs> it's a, it's, yeah. it's amazing because he was really, as you said, maybe he went in many directions, but uh, again his, his background was really pharmacology, and he he, he was somehow focused, you know, on in dopamine and 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 of course all the work that he has done with Bob Lefkowitz that would not have been possible without him huh? because yeah. ma- ma- Mark was really I would say the, the technical backbone you know yes. he, he was this guy that knew everything that was done before and uh, how the, the experiment should be conducted you know Bob was probably more like the inspiratory you know and uh, but but uh, 
uh, and probably defining the research uh, access and things like that. But Mar Mark was really like the technical backbone, you know, knowing what it should be done, how it should be done, and things like that. Yeah, that, that really came through through the different discussions. And I think Bob also mm. acknowledged that a lot of mouse models that were generated were fully characterized in, in, in Mark's lab, and, and that information came from there. Um, okay, so I, I ask this question from every guest on the podcast, and I think I know what the answer is, but what is your favorite GPCR? Okay. Yeah, it's definitely dopamine receptor. So. <laughs> is it D2 because of you, of you cloning it, or is it D1 because you worked with, with Mark, or is it, could it be a trans the transport, the dopamine transporter as well? Yeah, I would say the D3, of course, because, you know, we were, when we cloned the D3, it was really breaking the, uh, the rule somehow because, you know, at this time it was only D1 and D2, D1 that was a, positive activator of cyclic AMP, D2 inhibitor of cyclic AMP production. And then the D3 was really like new in the game, you know, and uh, it's actually, it remains my most cited paper, you know, <laughs> the molecular <laughs> cleaning of the D3. And, uh, and then, that, yeah, that, that was really uh, very, very nice. But, but then it was a teamwork, of course, with Pierre Sokolov, you know, and in Jean-Charles Schwartz lab. And, uh, and the, that is more, more, yeah, I'm a, I would say I consider myself as the father of the dad and maybe Mark is the mother then <laughs> because he <laughs> offered me, offer me these flowers, you know. <laughs> yes. Uh, then, uh, then, yeah, but, but it was definitely uh, uh, the dopamine transporter and, and the dopamine transporter knockout mice because I think that this is probably one of the more most successful in terms of um, providing new information. Yeah. Uh, mouse model that has been done. I think there are probably maybe hundred of papers that use the data knockout, you know. And when I left, for example, you know, Raoul, uh, one year after, you know, he published his science paper using the data knockout, you know, and there were more papers like that. And even Martin, you know, the, the very nice paper that Martin published about dopamine signalization with AKT and things like that, uh, that he published in cells a few years after I left. I mean, I mean again, the, the entrance door for these discoveries were the use of the data knockout. Wow. You know, the, the, then it, it, it has been really a very powerful tool that Mark used a lot. I used a little bit less because I didn't have the same... Uh, talented postdoc in my lab, I would say. Uh, but, but still, uh, myself, I published maybe 20 papers using the data knockout match. You know, it learned, it teaches us a lot about what hyperdopaminergia uh, made into an animal model, you know. And it's not like a schizophrenia, a model for schizophrenia, even mm -hmm. though schizophrenia is a, somehow a consequence of hyperdopaminergia. Then it's not really like a schizophrenia model, but it's really the model for hyperdopamine energy. And it really showed us everything that happens when you have too much dopamine in the brain. Then, uh, yeah, it, it was really a, a fantastic tool uh, for, for us uh, to, to, to use. After that, I work also myself on the vesicular monoamine transporter, the VMAT2. The, the knockout was done uh, in Mark's lab after I left. Uh, with Yan Min Wang, you know, she was a postdoc student in his lab. And, uh, but the knockout for VMAT2 uh, was lethal, which in mice were dying yeah. just yeah. after birth. And then I, I did the conditional knockout for VMAT2 and also published many papers with that, you know, and find uh, the most interesting was the deletion of VMAT2 in noradrenergic neurons using dbh cray uh, breeding and uh, and then yeah that, that was I, actually since i left mark's lab you know i kept on the same track you know to to develop the most uh, interesting animal model you know to to really think about the one that needed to be developed because it takes time 
and you don't, you cannot, I, I mean, at least I cannot afford, you know, to do 20 knockout in my life. That was my question. Uh, <laughs> that was my question. So Raul had mentioned that uh, I think right now in his lab, they have nine different models. And I think yeah, there's yeah. an astonishing huge number of, of animal models in, in Mark's lab. How many mouse models do you currently have in your your lab? Oh, I can tell you, I have D1 knockout, D2 knockout, D3 knockout, D1 cray, D2 cray, uh, not D3 cray. Uh, I have the VMAT 2 locks, uh, DBH cray mice, the D1 flippe, the A2A cray. Uh, we are also doing some work with microglial cells when we also have the CX3 cray mice. Uh, we have uh, Probably more. I think it's already 12. <laughs> wow, that's what I was I, I, I was telling myself I should have started counting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Least, yeah, yeah. 10, is... and, uh, and of course, we have also TH Cremites, uh, DBH Cre, I already told that, DBH Flippes also. Uh, yeah, we, we, we have many, many models. I, I try to decrease a little bit to focus more, you know. <laughs> Yeah, focus, 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 and focus. <laughs> exactly, uh, but um, but then uh, uh, yeah, that's about it. The thing, of course, is that it's you know something also that should be said here is that when we did the cloning, I, I actually a few a few months ago I I went back. I don't know why why, but look at my first nature paper. It was um, D two short and long isoform. Okay, four figures, no supplementary data. <laughs> Two, three years of work, okay. Uh, now, when you see what it takes, if you want to publish in this high impact journal, it's just amazing. Huh? It's a kind of selection by the money. Huh? Yeah. Be, 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 because you have to, I mean, turning by itself is not enough. You have to do electrophysiology, anatomy, behavior, um, optogenetic using a lot of different models yeah because in, in on top of the mice model we also have all these viruses you know yeah. um, to 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 do retrograde uh, labeling to do all this kind of thing and uh, and then yeah it, it's it's really uh, somehow it's a little bit frightening <laughs> yeah <laughs> Then, uh... It is, and I think I think sometimes when you get the reviews back from from after submitting a paper in this high impact journals, and then you see the work that you need to put in before you even send back, that's a year worth of work. Exactly, you know the paper we submitted for the D one D two uh, co expressing neurons. Uh, we received the review in May, since we have done experiments and we are going to submit it in two or three weeks. The wow. revision, you know, then, then yeah. it's like almost eight to nine months of, of experiment wow. to to respond to the reviewers and fingers crossed that it's going to go through. <laughs> and they don't but, come uh, back with another set of things to do. Exactly. But this is the way it is, I guess, you know, because probably simple uh, questions have been already answered, you know, then now things are becoming more and more complex and, uh, yeah. and you really want to to answer questions, you know, that are again much more and more complex, you know, than, uh... than cloning. And although, although, you know, we shouldn't minimize the impact of these papers where it was, you know, three days and you clone something and then you publish it. I think at the time with the tools of that course. were available, it was amazing to get. No, that. no, exactly. And, I, you know, I, I, I have enough uh, experience in research now. <laughs> I, I, I see these different waves, you know, there was a cloning wave and then after it was a knockout, you know, yes. you, you did a knockout and you, that was really new. And then came the optogenetic, you know, and then again, you did an optogenetic study, you published in high impact journal, you know, and things like that. And then uh, I don't know what will be the next uh, I mean, there are these things of intercessor and genetic, you know, that is really very powerful. Because we can really target subspecific uh, neuronal populations, you know, 
Uh, and then being able, you know, to couple that to behavior, in vivo behavior. This is really also something very new, you know, to do all this in vivo studies by manipulating pathways, by manipulating neuronal activities and things like yeah. that, you know. Then, um, then it, it, this is how it works. Uh, and now I can see my students, you know, when they want to do this kind of thing, they have to be good for uh, uh, coding, yeah. you know, computer analysis and stuff like that. And it takes uh, kind of different uh, skills yeah. to, to do that. Well, we have better tools. We have uh, capabilities that allow us to do much more. And I think that's what justifies the need to when, whenever you're submitting, submitting a paper, there's this high thresholds to publish in high impact journals sure sure and it, it's also very exciting you know because the things we can do now we were not able to do them like 15 years ago yeah. <clears throat> and we, we really have these very powerful tools to really dissect out behavior and to see you know which neuronal population are implicated in fear in depression in the uh, all, all these kind of things, you know. Then, of course, we are we are learning a lot, and it's actually very exciting to see how the field is moving up, you know. And uh, you have to to follow up also sometimes, you know. Yeah. Which is, yeah. But okay. uh, I, I, and even if you if you go, I, I'm not anymore, you know. In the I would say the the pure pharmacology, you know, of GPCR. But again, when I can, I can see new tools, uh, this biased agonist, antagonist, uh, uh, this new screening tool, you know, in order also to understand uh, the orphan receptor, what are they, what are they doing, and things like that. that, all, all that is, is exciting. Now we have this new technique of CRISPR, uh, kind also, you know, that... Uh, yeah. Yeah. You that would, is also something very powerful. You wouldn't have to to order all the uh, radio labeled ligands in yeah, the catalog <laughs> to figure out what what yeah, your yeah. Um, what your uh, yeah, yeah. receptor might bind to for sure. Yeah, yeah, right. exactly. And uh, then, then all, all that is, uh, I mean, very promising, you know. And uh, I hope I will be in the field for a few more years, you know. <laughs> The, the good thing about being in Montreal is that in France, you, know, you have this uh, age where you should retire, mm -hmm. and uh, which is not yet me. Uh, in France, I would have to retire maybe in five or six years. Yeah. Whereas here in Montreal, you know, I can work for more. Yes, yes, and I think I I don't know how it I don't remember exactly how it works in Montreal, but I think as long as you have funds and you can you can exactly. actually walk yourself to the lab and 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 do the work, uh, you're welcome. But exactly, I, I, and again in that in that respect, you know, Mark is a really very good role model because he was still working, and, uh, still he, he just had a very good grant, you know, to keep working, and uh, yeah. he, he he was still there, you know, still making very major impact on the field yeah. then uh, and he was not he, he's a little bit like Molière you know who, who died on stage you know <laughs> yeah and uh, Marx the same he was uh, like in in the full uh, strength of his activity you know and, uh, I have two last questions but why don't sure. we um, go uh, spin them around your experience working with Mark so one of the two questions is, was it, what is your advice for junior scientists who want to contribute to the field? And maybe focus on, on some advice that you got from Mark or something that you've seen in Mark's lab and then took it with you. I would say that, of course, you know that one of the famous words of Mark, I'm sure it has been said already, was that every Friday evening he was telling us, Ciao, guys. Have a good weekend. See you tomorrow. Okay? It means you have to work a lot. Yeah. I think there is no secret about that. And I, I remember my first thing when I was young, I was working then with encephalite. It was a narcotic meeting. And uh, there was a lecture from uh, Sir James Black, who... I think was a Nobel Prize for the beta adrenergic blocker drugs. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the talk he was giving was serendipity versus rationale in discoveries. Okay. 
And I remember very well what he told because I also tell it to my students. He said, RNDPT is directly proportional to the input work. Okay. Which is, of course, chance is there. You have somehow to be the right guy at the right place. Okay. And, uh, and look in your discovery, you know, to find the, the, the things that will actually matter. Uh, but, but still, yeah, you have to, to work a lot, you know. And some of, of my students do that, some not, you know, then that's uh, in their hand, you know. What I always also say to my students, because still, you know, science is very competitive. Not everyone that will actually be able to find a position in academy in the industry, okay? Then I always say my students, if you can, learn as much computer as you can, coding and things like that, because with that, you will always find a job somewhere, yeah. you know, if, even if it is not in science. Uh, then be work, be curious, do not inhibit yourself, and uh, don't hesitate to talk, to read also, because it's important to know if things have been already done or not. I, I am here for them also for that, you know, because uh, I've saw a lot of things and then uh, I can guide them and help them, which is what I do. But, you know, my postdoc, I don't talk to, like Mark. Huh? Mark, I was not like uh, uh, talking about science every day, huh? about my research project. Um, a week, once every other week, was enough, but then it's important to 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 put that into perspective, you know, and to talk to someone. Then I would say that to my students, uh, you know, work, be curious, be imaginative, and uh, and do not hesitate to talk to to your peers or to to other PIs, you know, to confront your your ideas, you know. I like that. And to kind of echo, you know, the hard work part, um, I think I can't remember who it was in, in one of the podcast panels uh, who was uh, new in the lab and was asking Mark, so what's the schedule look like? Is it nine to five? What does that look like? And I think Mark's response was, I'm already famous. So anything that you do is to build up your career. Basically. This is exactly it. <laughs> this is also something I tell to my students. Now you recall me that Mark told me that actually. He told me, he told me, you know, you 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 work for my fame and for your career. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, which I think you is know? really yeah, really yeah exactly. Yeah. All right, last question. Um, top three aha moments that you had as a scientist that shaped your trajectory. I think working with Mark is one of them, but we can uh, give and you can give any examples. Ah. I do have some precise moments. One of them was when we read the sequence for the D3 dopamine receptor, you know, with this long jet, yeah. trying to see the homology with the D2 and say, oh my gosh, this is a new one. Okay. And that was amazing because we were with Pierre Sokolov and me, and we were like, we were the first one ever in the world to see the sequence for, for a new dopamine receptor. You know, that was like hectic. The second one was, uh, I, I told you, I, I, I was doing the DAT knockout, the first ES clone that were actually bring, bearing the right recombination that I can see by uh, doing a, a thousand blood. That was really, wow. It was really, I share with Mark, you know, and it was very, and uh, please, the third one would be then the cloning of the dopamine transporter. You know, again, when, when uh, I was doing this degenerative PCR and I was able to see the, the of a new transporter, pair it with Mark, you know, and there was a tricky thing, you know, that you see something that nobody saw before you. <laughs> you know, it's, it's yeah. a very unique feeling, uh, and, uh, yeah, Th that Amazing. was, uh, yeah, I, I had other very good memories as a PI, but I would say these are my memories as a, as a bench uh, postdoc, bench working postdoc. Then, Thank uh, you. Thank you for sharing that. I think people can very much learn a lot from, from this 
segment of the podcast because there's a lot of advice that comes back, but there's also always, always new advice. If and when you are have job openings in your lab, where can people find you? Uh, okay, they can find me at my sbruno.giros at mcgill.ca. Okay. And uh, also just one last thing I should Please. say uh, in terms of advice, maybe. It's very easy to work a lot in the wrong direction. You know, I knew people like that. Uh, even in Mark's lab or in other labs, you know, that were really working 15, 16 hours a day, but not in the right direction, you know. That, that's why it's very important to confront your ideas and uh, 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 at some point to be able to say, okay, I'm going to stop to work on that lane because it does not bring anywhere. It doesn't yeah. bring me anywhere. Probably one of the most difficult things to do, you know, to, to be able to give up on a project in, in order to shift to another one that would be more successful. It's not an easy decision to, to take, you know, but, uh, uh, and again, confronting the idea, talking with other people, you know, that, that will make it uh, possible. I think that's, that's fantastic advice. And that's very important because, um, yes, it's difficult to pull the plug on something you've worked on for two mm. years, but you better pull the plug sooner than later. And then go into a different direction. And I think having these scientific conversations with with the PI, but also going to meetings and having these conversations is really helpful. That doesn't mean that you don't feel a loss when you no, have sure. to switch gear, gears. But I think it's part of it's part of growing, and it's also part of learning how to how to be a good scientist and know when it's, it's exactly some well. sometimes you have to be stubborn huh, and to keep on working, but. Again, it's not an easy decision to take. You know, sometimes you are, you have to to take it. You know, I, I just one last thing. I think it was this woman. I don't remember her name. Working with Richard Axel, you know, the one that actually cloned the odorant receptors. Uh, Vanessa Ruta. No, I don't. See, no, she gets the Nobel Prize with him. Oh, then actually. No. Uh, then I don't and, remember. Uh, she published a paper in Cell, maybe in ninety one or ninety two, and was his mark. She works. For 10 years trying to clone this receptor. She even works during a few years without being paid. Wow. Uh, and she was, she wanted to, to have it, you know, at the end she cloned, she cloned it. It was really a breakthrough and she got the Nobel Prize for that. Then you, you see, it, it's why it's, it's really a, a thin line huh, between decided where you should continue or not, you know, then yeah. it's, uh, but, but, but again, I guess she was supported by Richard Axel. Huh? He didn't order yeah. to stop and to quit. Huh? The, then that's why it, it's important to, to discuss with your uh, mentor and with peers. And, uh, as you say, exactly. being, try to see uh, what is going on. Exactly. And I think that's, that's very important. And sometimes, sometimes there's kind of a, a middle way where you put that project on hold momentarily or slow it down while you focus on something else. Uh, but I've heard stories about, you know, Brian Kobilka having to put columns in his, keeping the columns in, in his office and then deciding, you know, he got funding for something else where he almost ran out of funding. Can't remember the context. And then he got the Nobel Prize and then things things normalized. But since there were times where funding was difficult and then he had an idea, he pursued it, but he, it and the columns ended up in his office. Yeah, 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 that's why that's why it is a thin line, huh? you know, then yeah. to, to decide. Uh, there are two, but, and as you say, sometimes you have to have this project and to be able to have some what I call alimentary project, you know, yeah. Yeah. in order to to publish some papers and to have some funds, you know, exactly. and to keep your uh, at earth project on the side <laughs> in, in your office. Or... <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, thank you for the, your time, you know, it was such an amazing time talking to you. Uh, thank, thank you, you Yamina. It, it it was my pleasure. Thank you. Don't go anywhere. I'm going to stop recording and okay. uh, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you for joining us and listening to this Dr. GPCR podcast episode. We would like to thank our guest as well as take a moment to thank our team members, Attila, Ines, Monse, Ivana, Andrina, Balint, and Julia. A huge thank you to our ecosystem partners for their support, Domain Therapeutics, GPCR Therapeutics, Design Pharmaceuticals, Montana Molecular, and Orion Biotechnology.
You can connect with our partners directly in the ecosystem. So don't forget to join the Dr. GPCR ecosystem today. Please subscribe to the Dr. GPCR newsletter. Find us on YouTube. And if you're like our podcast, leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. You can also leave us a testimonial by following the link to the testimonial forms on in the ecosystem by using the um the footer. Another way to support us is to share your favorite Dr. GPCR program with your network and colleagues. Email us with any questions and suggestions at hello at drgpcr.com. And until next time, stay safe. <laughs>